All right, four down. No, five down. What a wonderful way to start an episode. I'm going to leave that in. I'm going to leave in me saying the wrong number. There's five down and only uh, only four to go to uh, to finish off core. Exciting. So uh, today I kind of felt the uh, kind of felt the urge to talk about our uh, our favorite malcontent, malodorous, anything but meticulous. <laughs> I'm having trouble with the M adjectives and improvisation. I'm not good at improv. We're talking about Mad Mad and Mim today. Um, so this is kind of an embarrassing one because uh, I wrote her off for a long time and. Uh, to talk about her is kind of to talk about my relationship with Arthurian mythology and then how I eventually just kind of cut ties with being a purist about it. Um, anyway, uh, I know I watched Sword in the Stone when I was a young child, but I lost all memory of it. It was like, it was like with Mosenrath, you know, I know I saw his episodes. I cannot tell you what I thought of him when I was a tiny child. So... Then, Sword in the Stone is just one of the Disney films that I don't revisit that often afterward. Like, I was always doing the Renaissance ones, you know, Aladdin, Little Mermaid, Hercules. Those were my, those were my big classics, and then Emperor's New Groove dropped, and that became my world. Um, but, uh, unfortunately, I let Sword in the Stone fall by the wayside, even though it's, it's honestly one of, okay, this is, this is hard to say, because, like, I was going to say it's one of the best Disney movies, but then I realized that, like, there are, there are at least 15 others I would put on its level. It, it's just a really good, feel-good time, you know. I like it because it's, uh, it's simpler. It's not this grand quest or anything. I love the grand quests. I really do. Those are my favorite ones. But Sword in the Stone kind of kicks it back a little bit, and it's just like... Let's talk about the importance of intelligence and wisdom when you go out to face the world. And that's the theme of the film. And, um, and eventually it is, in the end, it is uh, cleverness that allows our heroes to defeat Mim, even though she's not even really, she's not the uh, primary villain of, well, okay, she's the primary villain of the film. But she's not the, like, you have to defeat her to save the world villain. She's not playing a Maleficent role. Um, I'll, I guess I'll just explain a little bit. In case you haven't seen the movie, or if, if it's like my case where you were, you were a tiny child and now you don't remember anything about it. Um, primarily, Sword in the Stone is the story of Merlin training Arthur. And, you know, it's a very disney take. It's a very happy, feel-good take. Um, kind of just has that... That nostalgic retro feel that all the films from that time period have. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of magic and there's a lot of fun songs. And basically it's about Arthur, who goes by Wart back then. He wants to, you know, he wants to learn all the tough stuff. Like, how to be a knight. And Merlin's like, before we do that, we got to teach you important things. Like, reading, writing, and how to think critically. And... Like I said, when they get to, when they get to the part that with Mim, that's how they defeat her is by using a clever loophole instead of brute strength. Now, uh, this film eventually ends in Arthur drawing the sword from the stone and becoming king of England. Uh, that is the climax of the film. It is actually nothing to do with Mim. Mim is more like a side episode in the film she's um she's like one of the one of the steps it's almost an anthology of things that happen you know you have the incident with the fish and the barracuda you have the you have the romp in the woods with the squirrels and hazel who the fandom went nuts drawing human versions of and i can take or leave hazel she's fine um and then mim is like her own little contained story where Arthur ends up stumbling into her territory and she's like, oh, since you're in my territory and I just love all things vile, here I'm going to sing about how I am an evil witch. And, you know, she just does the whole spiel of what her powers can do, how she likes to kill plants, 
how she can materialize some objects from nowhere, change her shape, change her size, how she can look as beautiful as she wants, but she'd rather be ugly at the end of the day. Uh, so she, you know, kind of plays up that angle of, you know, I can be what I want. And I'm just, I just love being nasty. <laughs> and so Merlin comes along to rescue Arthur and the two of them get in a duel. Um, and it seems for a moment that Mim and Merlin are evenly matched, and they do that trope that's always golden, where the two, the two mages are shape-shifting into different animals that can combat each other, that are predator and prey. And uh, Mim finishes it off by exploiting a loophole in the duel to become a dragon, which <laughs> she had, you know, set out the rules to make Merlin think that she wouldn't be able to become a dragon but she lawyered that one and it wasn't even good okay like when ursula or hades does a deal with a loophole they very to the letter mim <laughs> mim's loophole is more in the spirit of the word <laughs> saying uh i i want to take fantastical creatures off the board no pink dragons and then she becomes a purple dragon but you could argue that the spirit of the word of originally like should have also taken that off the board and she just broke her own rule it's she's rules lawyering but nowhere near as good as ursula or hades could rules lawyer and i love that about her i love that she's the dorkier variant of the uh of the rules lawyer disney villain uh and anyway the uh the final blow in the duel She's the dragon, and there's really nothing that can combat that in terms of sheer strength. So Merlin becomes a germ and infects her with a disease that takes her out. And then they don't kill her. They just leave her recuperating in bed. Um, she hates the sun because the sun is nice and she doesn't like nice things. So uh, they uh, make sure she has a good view of the sunlight. And then they just leave her with the implication that... the maybe she might come back to bother us again one day you know they don't really put too big of a deal on it it's not like uh it's not at all a maleficent deal um it's very far from that and you know it almost it feels like if they had ever made an animated series out of sword in the stone which now i'm kind of wishing they did because because they kind of had the perfect setup for it with the film ending on arthur becoming king they could have done a lot more about what happened to him after he took the throne and learning diplomacy and put in some other stuff from the myths, maybe we'd see a Disney Nimue? Is that how you pronounce it? The Lady of the Lake. Maybe you'd see her Disney-fied. Um, but Mim definitely is in the right place to be the main antagonist for that because they just they just leave her. She's she's their Saturday morning cartoon villain. Like, we, we need to duel you another day. We need to have a silly little rivalry going on because we can't have a hero story without a silly little rivalry. Um, so anyway, that's, that's the movie. As I said, I, um, I let myself forget about all this. It all just drained out of my head. And I was a big mythology buff. I like to read, um, both, uh, pop fantasy and, like, if I could get my hands on books of bare bones Greek myths, I would. And my next experience with Arthurian mythology is actually a couple of them. Um, so... One that kind of got to me was um, the Water Trilogy by Cara Dalkey, uh, which has a villain I might do an episode on later if this series is long enough, um, because I love him. Uh, even though he has nothing to do with the actual Arthurian part of the story, it's, um, it's kind of a fake-out story in that it starts out being about mermaids and Atlantis, and you think it's going to be this complete nautical underwater fantasy, and to some degree it is, but then halfway through it shifts and it's really telling the origin story of how a mermaid went from Atlantis to the Enchanted Lake to become the Lady of the Lake that granted Excalibur. And there's, um, there's a lot of convoluted lore there for how Excalibur was actually forged underwater. And it's, it's a good read. It's, it's not at all, it's definitely an AU of Arthurian myth, but it's a good read. But, then, then I ended up tripping and falling into something a little pretentious. Um, so my uh, grandparents on my adoptive father's side 
Um, he, he's my stepdad, but also my legal dad. Um, we're just going to call him my dad. He's not my bio dad. He's my dad. Uh, they, uh, we stayed at their house a lot when we would be on trips up to, you know, see the family for Thanksgiving. And my grandma liked to lend me books from her collection to read because I was a very voracious reader. And um, I, I miss, I miss that grandma a lot. She was one of the best relatives I've ever had, honestly. Um, she's no longer with us. Back to the point, um, she did lend me some things that were um, a little more mature than you might expect I would read as a teen. Um, a couple of murder mysteries that uh, I just ate up. And one of the uh, things she got me absolutely in a little obsession phase for was Mary Stewart's Merlin books, which are, again, an AU on R3 in mythology. But it's um, a quartet that kind of takes, it kind of follows Merlin through his entire life. And it does kind of this magical realism sort of thing where um, some of the, uh, some of the spells and some of the famous things are toned down. Like, um, I hate that this is the one that comes to my mind because I'm going to have to word my language carefully here. Um, there's uh there is a part in mythology where Uther Pendragon impregnates a woman by um, shapeshifting into someone that she uh, wants to be with. And this is a very bad thing. And if you're a shapeshifter, don't ever do this. It's awful and it's, it's against consent. I'm, I'm laughing because I'm nervous, not because I think anything about this is funny. But in... Um, in the Mary Stewart books, he doesn't literally shapeshift. It's more like um, they sneak him past the guards and then Isol knew it was him and they were having an affair that was completely like above the board but under the table, if that makes sense. Um, but at the same time, they don't completely drain magic out of the story. They have mysticism. They have, um, they have discussion of gods that was, you know, that was very... Weirdly, I think their cosmology of religion very lines up with my own spirituality because <laughs> um, it kind of did, I, I don't know how to explain it correctly, but it kind of did this balancing act of, you know, monotheism can be correct, but polytheism can also be correct. And there are circumstances that uh, are conducive to these things, both existing at the same time and, and uh not to get too much into my religious views, but that's something that I appreciate a lot just because I, I'm inclusive, you know, I never like to say that something's wrong, but it's flat out not possible. Anyway, these books, they're very, very detailed. Um, and again, maybe a little, maybe a little beyond the subject matter that I would have been ready for, but, you know, I kind of enjoy just plunging into the deep end and reading some of the edgy. And, um, and so I got to know all about some of the uh, darker sides of the Arthurian lore. And, of course, the uh, villains that are played up uh, by the end of this series are Morgoth, Morgana, and Mordred. And... Yeah, I'm not going to go too into detail describing any of them because they're not important. Let's just say that they're kind of, you know, they're edgy. They're, um, you know, they did the uh, Morgoth is Arthur's half, no, not, yeah, Morgoth is Arthur's half sister plot. And um, if if you if you know, you know. <laughs> if you don't know, um, I won't tell you here. But. Uh, you know, it was kind of this darker take, you know, like they're the, they're the bad family. They're, they're just like, kind of made them real, like real greedy, selfish people trying to get ahead in this world and not very, not very cartoonish of villains. And so for a while, this whole thing was my definitive, um, my definitive Arthur canon. And then later my mom lent me 
a uh, trilogy, and I forget who wrote it, uh, but it was um, a retelling of Tristan and Isolde. And I, I said Isolde earlier with Uther, but it's Igraine. It's Uther and Igraine. And Isolde is with Tristan. I'm sorry, everyone. It's been a while since I've been hardcore into this. You can just, just don't rip into me, okay? Just deal with it. I'm going to make mistakes. But it's a Tristan and Isolde retelling. And again, that's kind of, um, you know, more of an adult take on things. Um, very much a melodramatic romance novel, but also a retelling of a myth. Um, and from there, my next big experience would be um, in college, I would take some medieval literature and we would go kind of back to the roots. And I read some of the delay of Marie de France and of Chrétien de Troyes. And those are mostly set in the Arthurian universe and kind of do side stories of different knights and lords of the era. And those are really fun, just kind of for building this world. Um, like, there were many Marie de France that I loved. Um, trying to think what was the one. What was the one? There was one about, was it Yannick? Where he turns into a bird? And... Oh, gosh, I don't even remember anymore. It's been so long. I need to reread those. Um, and uh, Chrétien de Troyes, I remember. A little better, I remember, The Night with the Lion, because that's how I got uh, introduced to the mythical figure of Lunette, um, who is one of my was one of my favorites in the Arthurian canon, you know, depending on how canon you count her. But, uh, you know, she's kind of a sass bucket. She's the... She's the handmaiden to the uh, main love interest. And then her attitude is like, um, the, the romance is kind of messed up, but she ships it. And, and I remember she has dialogue that basically boils down to, why are you acting like such a girl? She says to the uh, main love interest, even though Lunette herself is a woman. And it's kind of like, well, you don't see me acting that melodramatic, so get off your butt and stop crying like that kind of thing and Lunette is very you know she's kind of conniving she does a lot of things to try and bring bring the two lovers together through the trials and tribulations like when the main guy shows up disguised to try and win back the love interest hand Lunette knows it's him right away and she's like oh I can use this and so um Really what you have between all of these things is this building of a much more mature and serious um, fascination with Arthurian lore. And kind of what takes it back a step but also doesn't is uh, James A. Owen's Chronicles of the Imaginarium Geographica series. Which surprisingly I don't think has yielded a whammer. Um, I'm going to have to read those again and make double sure that there's no whammers in there. Because you never know. There's usually always one lurking. In the side. As a side character. Uh, but that one had Mordred as the villain. But in an even more high fantasy capacity. Where they kind of gave him a uh, Sauron level threat. Except he also is physically present for a lot of his misdeeds. Like you can see him, you can see him actually committing murder on screen. Well, on page, it's a book. Uh, but then it also brings him into a redemption arc later that I weirdly don't hate. Just kind of because they played a long game with it. And um, part of it involved, you know, uncovering uncovering his history. And uh, and then he'd been in exile and for a while for being a bad boy. And it, it all just kind of gelled well. And they also had a version of Merlin in this story. Uh and in, in Chronicles of the Imaginarium Geographica, it's like a giant free-for-all mythological crossover. Um, that series is basically about Tolkien, Lewis, and their friend Charles... I forget his last name. Those three, who you know, were tight in actual history. It's fictionalized versions of them going to the realm of imagination and saving the world and exploring 
all the different stories there are and said that this is how they got inspired to write their own stories. Um, and as I said, there is a Merlin in this too. He is, uh, he's also a bad boy. And part of the, uh, part of the plot shakeup later on is, um, finding out that part of what happened is Merlin screwed over Mordred big time. Because in this AU, it's actually Merlin and Mordred who are brothers, not Mordred and Arthur. And um, and then Merlin kind of starts out as a neutral figure. And you're not supposed to know it's him. He's a cartographer who does enchanted maps. And he's been confined to a little room where all he can do is draw maps. And, uh, and it starts out kind of, um, this dude did some bad crimes and here he must stay. But uh, then over the course, you know, he also is kind of like, yeah, I've spent enough time in bad boy jail that I'm, you know, I'm mellow now. I just want to draw maps. It's all good. And uh, so he kind of reconciles you know, having screwed over Mordred in the past. Um, I won't say exactly how because I recommend these books and I would rather you go read them than listen to me. He was a Mad Madam Mim vlog to tell you the entire summary of Chronicles of the Imaginarium Geographica. And in fact, if you've been listening to any of these books and you've been like, um, you've been like, oh, I want to read that. Um, anyone who desperately wants to read the Tristan Isolde, post a comment and I'll track down that author for you. Um, I always love giving book recommendations, but uh, author's discretion, because most of these series contain... Um, varying degrees of adult subject matter but anyway um chronicles was the closest i got to you know a more kind of young teen friendly version of uh, the arthurian lore and even then it still had some dark moments like i said you have some moral gray you have the idea of redemption you have the idea that uh merlin is not a true ultimate good and so it's still kind of this this focus that's more like mature and adult. And so you can see by this time my Arthurian experience through all these series and all these books has been very, you know, it hasn't been very cartoonified, one might say. And so I was very picky about adaptations from then on because I wanted them to live up to the caliber of what I had been reading, not in quality but in tone. So I joined the Villains War Forum and the Disney versus non-Disney community and uh, and Mad Men and Mim has been um, spoken of a lot here because you know we're all about those Disney villains all about that nostalgia and um, like I said GA Villain did the Sorcerer Society where he buddied her up with Yzma and Mosenrath and those those two, you know, I was already in this alliance for, for Yzma and Mosenrath alone, but then they're friends with Mim. And uh, I'm not a big fan of Mim because I've been, you know, reading all these lofty books about Arthurian lore. And, you know, I've been hanging out with Mordred and Morgana and Edgy Morgoth and just... I... I called her names. Um, to this day, I get needled because I called her Mad Mad Mediocre, which I I hate now. I hate that I ever did that. I, uh, basically I was like, you know, I, I have seen better than this. Arthurian lore can do better than this. It can do more serious. Except here's the thing. Out of all the villains that I listed... In all those books, they were effective villains. They were well written, but none of them were very fun. Mim starts wearing me down because she is fun. And she actually has the zany energy to match with Yzma. Um, like I've said, they kind of, they kind of go together in the Disney villain branding, like um, you have your main Disney villains who get front and center. You have your Maleficent, Jafar, etc. But then Yzma and Mim are kind of those weird purple ones who we bring out every once in a while when we want to do the wacky deep cut. Um, and actually, after talking with G.A. Villain, I've kind of realized that uh, 
except for the fact that he is not purple and he is not a witch, that, uh, that Honest John Falfellow is kind of in the same boat. Like, we pull him out whenever we need a wacky deep cut. And, uh, he, he's also one of mine. He's one of my darlings. Um, one of my fur, my few furry crushes. Uh, and, uh, anyhow, I start getting more into Mim just through virtue of the, uh, fan works in the Sorcerer Society. But it still took me a while to sit down and actually watch Sword in the Stone. The reason I did so is because I realized that Mim would not be hard to cosplay. And I had a Halloween coming up. So I wanted to sit down and watch the film to make sure that I actually would like her enough to want to dress as her. And yeah, I, I watched the whole movie and it's just... It may not be lofty, but it's, it feels good. It's... It's nice, and it's fun, and it's, it's a musical. And sometimes I value that levity even more than your deepest literary themes. You know, it's just a, a film that felt good to watch. And so, you know, I kind of at that moment, I didn't dramatically do so or anything, but I'm realizing looking back at that moment, I kind of forsook the edgier stuff um even if it took me a while to transition out of because i was like you know this is the memorable stuff this is the one i want to dress up as this is the villain that gets me and i still appreciate arthurian lore but like uh for the examples of um i got super excited when morgana turns up in sophia the first i got super excited when morgana turns up in troll hunters i'm like no Give me more things that balance, like, the levity with the loftiness. And Mim absolutely can play in the deep end of the pool with the big boys. Um, in fact, um, often in my writing, I let her go a little darker and bloodthirstier than Disney would have been allowed to show. My rationale is if she, uh, if she took such pleasure in killing plants at random... And if she was willing to shapeshift into a predator to try and cannibalize other people that were in animal form at the time, she's she's willing to go pretty far. She's she's a serial killer type. You know it. In your heart, you know it to be true. So, anyway, um, the sad fact about that Halloween, though, is because uh, I ended up having to go... Um, up into a particular city. I don't know that I wanted to name too many locations. Because, you know, public internet forum. But I went to a big city because one of my aunts was getting married. And I brought along I brought along my Mim costume because it was going to be Halloween. And I brought along the dress I was going to wear to the ceremony. And I had a masquerade mask that I was going to wear for the reception. <laughs> Just because I'm, I'm me and I'm like that. And, uh... What happens is I come down with this horrible cold. And this was this was before this was before the twenty twenties. So um that was back when it was more socially acceptable to do things even if you were sick. So I was so excited about getting to attend the wedding and to go out take my little cousin tr trick or treating that I forced myself to do both those things. Despite being horrendously sick. <laughs> and I've only just now put it together that with the way Mim's arc ends is sort of the stone. <laughs> Was that fate playing a gigantic trick on me? <laughs> Did I get the Merlin disease? <laughs> Did I have to reenact the arc of her healing in order for her to come back for... For her renaissance and my favorites. <laughs> Life's just funny like that, you know? Anyway, yeah. Um, it was not exactly the best of times. Tromping around in the snow. Um, dressed as Mad Men and Mim when I had a cold. But I was determined. And I did it anyway. You know, I'm glad I did it. Except for the part where, you know, nowadays I'm... I'm less inclined to 
still keep doing things when sick, and you all know why. Um, I actually, I'm just remembering that must have been, oh, that must have been either 2013 or 14, because, um, depending on when Frozen came out, because I remember that one of my cousins, who I escorted out on the trick-or-treating run, was Elsa in a little kind of um, simple costume. But as we were out, because I like said this is in a big city, um, I remember seeing um, one woman who was uh, at her doorstep passing out candy, the way I usually like to do if I don't have to go to a wedding on Halloween. Um, and this woman was wearing the most beautiful Elsa cosplay. Like, it was all shimmery and sequined. And, you know, I couldn't tell you if she ordered it from a pro or if she just made it by hand it was it looked it looked high quality and it was very shiny and regardless of your feelings on Elsa that's you know it was really cool to see a grown-up go all out like like the way I like to do but with a larger budget um so coming back um I think it's pretty straightforward from here that once Mim's in the favorites and they get in sorcerer society with her I'm like okay now she should go in the Mosenrath team in Elements of Harmony and then Elements of Harmony I had to can and then she was right away there for the Wham army and you can say the rest is history I'll say that the one other thing though um that kind of kept energy going for her for a while is um when G.A. Villain and I um did a little little bit of a deep dive into um the old uh, disney duck comics which would often have a short little interlude with a story about mad men and mim causing mischief with magic and i i can't say i've read all of them uh, i don't know if that's possible but i i've read a good deal of them and they're just funny little stories like, I don't know, I suppose there must be some aspects of them that wouldn't age well because they're older. Just, just as a warning if you're going to go look things up. But I, don't, I can't remember much off the top of my head that was, like, actively badly aged. Um, but we had things like, uh, you know, Mim is trying to get Captain Hook to fall in love with her and he's having none of it. and And I'm just like... I've never thought about that before, but that's exactly what their dynamic would be in the Disney crossover universe. That's exactly what it'd be. That's the guy she would go for. And he would be like, no, no, I, I am into Smee only, not you. You are not the short, wacky Disney villain that I devote my life to. Get out of here, lady. Um, and uh, she's oftentimes the gang leader of the Beagle Boys, which is a really fun alliance. I took it away from her in Taking Back the Crown because I, um, there's too many Beagle Boys to keep track of and they all blend together and they're not defined enough. I gave her the Fearsome Four from Darkwing Duck in their place because, um, they need a better boss. <laughs> and morally, Mim is not better than Negaduck, but, uh, I'm gonna go on a limb and say she'd be a better friend to them. She likes them. She thinks they're adorable. Even when they're failures. That's when they're failures is sometimes the best part. Um, but yeah, it's a callback to how she was often in these comics a gang leader of the Beagle Boys. Um, and you would have some silliness going down with their partnerships. Um, you had one that I remember. I remember very clearly this one because I actually did a little bit of a, an homage to it in, in my fic. Um, where... One of her cousins came around who was, uh, I can't remember if he was also a wizard or if he just carried an aura of bad luck. But it's like wherever he went, bad things would happen just because he's cursed with bad luck. And so the Beagle Boys try to take him out on heists. And Mim's like, yes, definitely do that. That won't backfire on you in any way. And then she just sits and watches it plays out as, uh. As her cousin completely unintentionally wrecks every single heist. <laughs> and it's just silly stuff like that. And, uh, and you know, I kind of talked 
in the Yzma episode, if you've come from there, I've talked about how um, important it is to me to have um, female characters who don't fit the mold for traditional femininity, that they're a little, like, a little awkward, a little clumsy. Um, and I don't know if I'd say Mim's clumsy. I'd say she uh, she's very poised in the fact that, like, how to put this. All her spinning and jumping around might look like it's wanton and random, but she never lands anywhere she doesn't want to. You you got to notice that. Um but also she's what gets to me is that she's rather proud of the areas in which she's not chasing traditional feminine goals. She's she's a bruiser like Isma. As I said before, she takes a lot of pride in being ugly and you know that that's an inspiring thing like I, I couldn't tell you how I measure on an attractiveness scale especially because there is no objective attractiveness scale really um which which means which means that um there are there are medians by which Mim would be um considered beautiful, but don't ever tell her that because she will slug you in the eye if you if you tell her that. Um and uh the thing is that I often, you know, worry if I'm not as good looking as other people and then, you know, you have characters like Mim and it's like, um I know she'd ask me, why do you care? I'm like, yeah, why do I care? <laughs> and it's kind of just that little empowerment. And like I said, she's not clumsy, but she does um she does act out physically more than uh than a lady would, you know. She throws hands. And so again it makes me feel a little better about um not totally being a high femme, but also not totally being a tomboy. Because um, also she's, you know, she wears a voluminous skirt. She has uh, lace bloomers. She's got a little feminine side, even if she doesn't like to, she doesn't like to be pretty, but she does like to indulge femininity in some respects. Um, Come to think of it, probably what happens is she's trying to dress as tacky as possible. So, I think, I think that's pretty much everything except for uh, the shipping role. Um, took me a while to get around to doing the Mim and I Am a Ghoul ship, even though I was kind of the last one on the uh, the Villains War community to do so. Um, like everyone else had already jumped on it because of uh, G.A. Villain and Manwu's work. And so uh, I kind of dug my heels in on purpose for a while because I wanted to be different. Like I always want to be I always want to be that standout one. Like oh I come up with all my own ideas baby. And I'm trying to loosen up on that. Um, and again it kind of calls back to you know, the whole reason I wrote Mim off in the first place is because I was trying to be lofty and intelligent when really I just wanted to have some fun. So, you know, it's kind of had to be an arc of, um, yeah, other people had the same idea because it's fun. And so eventually I, I, came, I came around and I'm like, yeah, they're really similar. And you know what? I love I love the dynamic they'd have. Of, you know, traditionally non-romantic. They would do horrible things to impress each other. And sometimes they sometimes they hate each other as a form of flirting. And that's fun. Because, you know, it's two villains who love to be disgusting and nasty. So let's just make them disgusting and nasty. But they love it. And they're happy about it. Uh, though, with a caveat, is that... Uh, I ended up making them both legitimately polyamorous. I might talk about Agul's ships more when I get to him. And, you know, like with him, it's canon. He has several wives. Um, even though he, like, my ships for him, he uh, treats with more respect than uh, 
than his bunch of wives because they're villains on his level and also they will slap him if he tries he tries crap um mim however i ended up finding two other partners with whom i enjoy seeing her and uh these are both um weirdo crossovers but isn't everything i do um one is raymond smith from the series wakfu because god i think i actually put them together in the beginning because they had the same mbti i went through an obsession phase where i type character mbtis and i had to stop myself doing it because i started putting mbti types into them more than i would their actual canon voices so i was like no no we have to get rid of the letters because the letters are affecting my keeping them in character um but to this day like even though the types that they gave remy and mim i don't even know if that'd be accurate anymore but i basically i realized they both had a streak of chaos like i will do what i want when i want and they both had a thirst for for violence and big showy things um big showy displays of violence like we're gonna blow stuff up we like blowing stuff up and even though it seems like this utterly nonsensical aesthetic combination of this kind of D D thief and then this uh witch from an arthurian side story that isn't really arthurian canon but what what is and isn't anymore what is and isn't anymore? Like any of the books I said, you could argue cases for and against. Um, but ultimately, it's uh, it's been a fun it's been a fun pairing, and um, I like having it on the back burner for when I'm not in the mood for Mim and a Ghoul that day. And then the other one, this one's kind of more intuitively, ah, uh, yeah, um, Hannibal Roy Bean from Shaolin Showdown because he also is. A man who enjoys just being nasty, but also he shapeshifts. So we got two shapeshifters who just want to be mean to everyone. And it's, yeah, I don't see them as like getting a overly mushy romantic. I see them as more, um, more on the physical side, but they get on well. That's what I'm saying. And, uh, and you know, Hannibal, Remy and Agul, they all get along. They're buddies. They share. It's a solid arrangement because I, I like doing that. I like, I like giving my favorite characters lots of love, lots of romantic love too, and then not complicating it up too much. So, uh, yeah, that, that'd be my story with Mim. And, uh, that leaves us, uh, only three others to go before we have completed Core. Anyway, uh, I'd say I hope you enjoyed this, but, uh, but I know that Mim herself would have wanted you to hate this vlog. So I, I guess, I guess for her sake, just this once, I hope you hated this. <laughs> but not really. <laughs>